Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening to our uh, speaker who is in Israel, where it's uh, seven thirty in the evening. Um, we have the honor of uh, welcoming Rabbi David Galinkin to our uh, weekly or biweekly uh, lunch and learn that is on Israel and Zionism. And uh, today, Rabbi Galinkin, who is the current uh, president of the Schechter Institute, and I keep seeing on the website that, that there's going to be a new president coming well, up. Well, he's the, the president. Oh, am I muted? No. No. Uh, he's the president of the graduate school. I'm the president of the in, entire umbrella okay. organization. Oh, so, so you're, not, you're, not, you're not leaving that position? I'm not going anywhere, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I was, I, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> okay. Um, but the Schechter Institute uh, is, is a wonderful, wonderful place in Jerusalem that uh, is uh, concerned about uh, spreading Yahadut, Judaism, to Jews in the Jewish state. Uh, many people may know that Israel, the the makeup of Israel is about 15% Dati and 85% low Dati, okay? 15% religious and uh, about 85% Chiloni, okay, or secular. And uh, it's very possible to be a, a full Israeli citizen and not to know too much about Shabbat or Yom Tov or Kashrut or uh, even Jewish uh, history and so on and so forth. And, uh, and one of the most important things about what the Schechter Institute does is train uh, Israelis, Israelis to uh, reach out to members of the is Israel population uh, who are yearning, yearning to learn, but uh, if it's going to be in the, quote, orthodox way, they're not interested, and they're not going to be involved, and they're not going to be connected. Uh, and so there's a huge, huge need. And uh, Rabbi Galinkin, who is, uh, was uh, uh, born in America and made Aliyah in the 70s uh, and uh, is ordained from the JTA Jewish Theological Seminary, and has been, uh, was my teacher when I first began uh, my uh, rabbinic uh, journey. Uh, my first Talmud teacher at uh, Schechter when it was <laughs> the, uh, there was a, a gap year program. Uh, and uh, I spent that year between uh, university and uh, rabbinical school. So, uh, Rabbi Glinken and I go back uh, many years and uh, uh, he officiated my grandfather's funeral and uh, we've been in touch and we had a wonderful opportunity uh, to get together a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he uh, offered and said, gee, I'd love to come and speak to the community. So I'm gonna stop speaking <laughs> and uh, invite my friend, my colleague, a uh, very, very important a uh, person doing really important things uh, in Israel uh, that is uh, under the auspices of uh, the Masorati movement, which uh, to which we are connected. Masorati, of course, meaning traditional, and uh, that is our sister organization uh, in Israel uh, as conservative Jews. So, without any further ado, uh, I want to tell you, uh, Rabbi Klingon, that I did. I sent out emails to all of our uh, Ransack colleagues and uh, to a bunch, a whole bunch of people. We are uh, a small group, but we are a group that's very, very interested in what you have to say. And uh, thanks to our Hazan, we are, are going to be uh, taping this so that we can get uh, your Torah to as many people as we well, can. Well, thank you very much, David. <laughs> thank you very much, Rabbi Yaffe. And uh, Rifuash, mom, sorry to hear that you have uh, COVID. <laughs> I had it in January. <laughs> I had a relatively minor case. My wife 
just finished having COVID, but uh, it seems that at some point every human being on the planet is going to get it. And the main thing is that it should be as mild uh, as possible. So, Rifuash okay. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to frame my discussion today with a little uh, drasha. Uh, there's a phrase that appears only two times in the Torah, uh, and that phrase is lech lecha. Lech lecha means get you up and go. And you know, today when your rabbi and I or your cantor want to find a verse in the Bible, you look in a concordance and you look it up and you see how many times the word appears and where it appears. The rabbis in the Talmud didn't have concordances. They just knew the Bible by heart. <laughs> and they noticed, they noticed that the phrase lech lecha only appears twice in the entire Torah. And the first time is in Breshi, Genesis chapter 12. Lech lecha me'artzecha, umi moladatecha, umi betavicha, ela aratz hasher eka get you up and go from the place where you were born to the place that I will show you, which we would call Zionism. Uh, and the second Lech Lecha is in Genesis chapter 22. And in Genesis chapter 22, which we read also on the on Rosh Hashanah, is the story of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And God says to Abraham, Lech Lecha El Eretz HaMoriah, get you up and go to Mount Moriah which the rabbis of the Talmud understand to be Judaism. In other words, this is your devotion to God. Are you willing to sacrifice your son? And the question they ask in the Midrash is, Lech lecha, lech lecha, hey adif. Lech lecha, lech lecha, which is more important? Is it the lech lecha of going to the land of Israel? Or is it the lech lecha of going to Mount Moriah of your devotion to God? And of course, the rabbis of the Talmud cannot agree and everybody has their own opinion. <laughs> But I would like to use that midrash as a way of framing uh, our question uh, by here it's evening, by you it's afternoon, which is that the problem of Judaism in the state of Israel during the past 74 years, uh, soon next year 75 years, is that we have not found a way to reconcile the lech lecha of Judaism and the lech lecha of Zionism. Uh, on the one hand, you have 20% or these days, perhaps 25% of the Israeli public who define themselves as Orthodox, and half of them define themselves as ultra-Orthodox. And the ultra-Orthodox believe in the Lech Lecha of Judaism, but they don't believe in the Lech Lecha of Zionism. And they live their lives as if they're still living in Poland or in Russia uh, 200 years ago. And on the other hand, you have 15 or 20% of the Israeli public who are staunchly secular who are opposed to learning about Judaism, that their kids should learn anything about Judaism, who obviously never go to a synagogue and don't wanna have anything uh, to do with Judaism. Uh, and these two groups are engaged in what's called in German, a, kult, a Kulturkampf, a culture war, a cultural war. And the cultural war plays itself out in the Knesset and on the Israeli media uh, on a regular basis between those who don't want any Judaism and those who don't want any Zionism. And one part of this story, you know, if you follow the Jewish Week or any other Anglo-Jewish newspaper, or if you read the Jerusalem Post, I'm sure you know that there are some 60,000 ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students in Israel who do not serve uh, in the Israeli army. And you probably know that there are some 100 ultra-Orthodox bus lines in Israel where women sit in the back of the bus. I, I did not make this up. They actually sit in the back of the bus. The women sit in the back and the men sit in the front so that they won't be mingled. Uh, and a number of years ago, one of our graduates at Schechter discovered that on the billboards in Jerusalem, there were no women. They had removed the women from all the billboards in Jerusalem because the Haredim did not want women uh, on the billboards. Of course, he saw to it that the women were restored to the billboards. But this was indicative of the Haredi approach uh, to Jewish life. And of course, the, the ultra-Orthodox and the Orthodox have a monopoly on marriage and divorce in the state of Israel, which is recognized by the state. Uh, and you know of the women of the wall and so on and so forth. And there's the stories about the, the religious sector of Israeli society you read about on the regular basis. What you probably do not read about on the regular basis is the other side of the coin. And those are the people who believe in being Zionists and who believe in being Israelis who don't want to have anything to do with Judaism. 
Uh, and I would like to illustrate this by telling you a few stories. And unfortunately, uh, the rabbi mentioned I made, moved to Israel in the 1970s. Well, to be exact, I moved to Israel in September of 1972. So God willing, this September, I will be in Israel for 50 years. And during the past 50 years, I've been collecting these stories. <clears throat> and I'm not going to tell you all the stories because then we would use up all of our time. But I'll just give you a sample of a few stories which illustrate the problem of secular, secularness, secularity uh, in the state of Israel. So I'll begin with a book. How many of you have read the book uh, As a Drip? Wait, what's that noise? How many of you have read the a novel As a Driven Leaf by Rabbi Milton Steinberg? Have any of you read that novel? Very famous Jewish novel, The Cantor and the Rabbi? And okay. me. And me. Good. And Barbara, excellent. Okay. The rest of you have homework. By next week, I want you to buy As a Driven Leaf by Rabbi Milton Steinberg and read it. It's the best Jewish historical novel ever written. It was published by Rabbi Milton Steinberg in 1939, and it's been in print ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody knows how many copies have been printed, but innumerable numbers, and it is now printed by Berman House. And it tells the story of Elisha ben Abuya, the famous Jewish heretic who rebelled against Judaism. And it's a wonderful novel. So a number of years ago, a friend of mine and I decided that we're gonna translate this novel into Hebrew. And I signed a contract with Yidiot, which is the largest book publisher in the state of Israel. Uh, because I know when, when Schechter, when we at the Schechter Institute publish a book, we publish, we print a thousand copies and we sell them. And that's about it. But if you print a book with Yidiot, it's going to have a mass distribution throughout the state of Israel. So we worked on the project for four years. We translated the book into Hebrew. And this, was, this story took place in February of 2015. So I get a phone call from the Hebrew language editor of the largest book publishing house in the state of Israel. And she had some specific questions about the book. And she says to me, there's one passage in the book which in one place appears with vowels and another place appears without vowels. So I page through the book and I see that she's talking about the first paragraph of Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers. Uh, Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai and gave it to Joshua and Joshua gave it to the elders and the elders gave it to the prophets and the prophets gave it to the man in the great assembly. And I'm sure that at one point in your lives or many points in your lives, you have studied Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers. In the course of my conversation with the Hebrew language editor of the biggest book publishing company in the state of Israel, I discovered number one, she did not know that this paragraph was a quote from Pirkei Avot. Okay, not everybody has to be an expert. Number two, she had never heard of Pirkei Avot. Okay? okay. The Hebrew language editor, maybe you can mute everyone, Panther. The Hebrew language editor of the largest book publishing company in the state of Israel had never heard of the fourth most important book in all of Jewish history. Now, why is that? Because in the secular public school in Israel, they don't study Pir Kabot. It's not part of the curriculum. The secular public school curriculum in Israel skips from the Tanakh to the Palmach. It skips from the Bible to modern Israel because nothing happened in between during those 2,500 years. And therefore, this very knowledgeable woman, who's the Hebrew language editor of the largest book publisher in the state of Israel, had never heard of Pirkei Avot. Story number two. Last summer, my wife and I sent, went to see a very interesting movie. I'm going to show you here a picture from the movie. Uh, this is a story from the Jerusalem Post. Last July, uh, you can see this is animation in case you can't see. Those are not real people. Uh, it's an animated film about the destruction of the second temple. It's called The Legend of the Destruction in Hebrew, Agadat Horban. Very, very well-made movie. And it received rave reviews. And the guy who made the movie, the animated film about the destruction of the second temple, he's a secular Israeli. His name is Gidi Dar. This is his picture. And Gidi Dar was in... Reviewed by the Jerusalem Post. Yes, very wondrous. You're a secular Israeli. Why did you make a film about the destruction of the Second Temple? That is not something that secular Israelis usually talk about at all. 
uh, Orthodox Jews may fast on Tisha B'Av or on the other minor fast days in memory of the destruction. Secular Israelis, even if they've heard of Tisha B'Av, certainly do not fast on Tisha B'Av. And this is what Gidi Dar answered. He said, growing up in the secular Israeli community, I felt disconnected from the stream of Jewish tradition. We didn't have access to what came before 100 years of Zionism. We learned something about the Bible, but there were 2,000 years of the Talmud and Jewish texts, not just the laws, but the poetry and the legends that we didn't know anything about. The culture I studied of Europeans and Americans, they had lived in their culture for many years, but Zionism burned its bridges to the diaspora. I understand why they had that impulse and it succeeded so well, but at a certain point, it came to a dead end. My grandfather was a pioneer, a chalutz. My parents were Zionists. But now we have a lot of material goods, but we have a spiritual problem. Zionism gave the Torah to the religious community saying, it belongs to you, not to us. This is not a quote from David Galinkin. This is a quote from a secular Israeli film producer and director. He's saying that he growing up in the state of Israel learned nothing about the destruction of the second temple or basically anything that happened during the past 2000 years. And he decided to make this film in order to reconnect to a very important episode in Jewish history. And the third and final story that I will tell you uh, happened to Professor Aaron Kirschenbaum who was a well-known professor in Israel. He passed away a couple of years ago in, in Jerusalem in his 90s. And Professor Kirschenbaum was a professor at the Tel Aviv University Law School. And you have to understand that in order to get into the Tel Aviv University Law School, you have to be, the students have to be really smart. If you're dumb, you don't get into the Tel Aviv University Law School, you get into some law college in Ramat Gan. But if you get into the Tel Aviv University Law School, it means you're the creme de la creme, the top of Israeli society. In his autobiography, Professor Kirschenbaum tells the following story. It's about page 321. If the book is in Hebrew, I read the entire autobiography. He says, for 30 years, I taught the law students at Tel Aviv University. And on a regular basis, I would say to them, what is this week's Parashat Shavua? What is this week's weekly portion? He says, for 30 years, they did not know the answer to my question, except for once. That week, an Israeli comedian named Gil Kopach did a skit on the television about Parshat Chaye Sarah. And that week, my students knew that the weekly portion that week was Chaye Sarah. <laughs> but during the other 30 years, they did not know the name of Parshat HaShavua because secular Israelis do not study Parshat Shavua. They do not go to synagogue on Shabbat and Parshat Tashavua is simply not a part of their lives. I could go on for hours telling you these stories, but I think that the point is clear that just as the state of Israel has a problem with the ultra Orthodox who do not recognize Zionism, it has a problem with the secular who do not know anything about Judaism. And the question is, what can we do to bridge that gap? And I would like to now share with you a chart. If you can make me a co-host, Cantor. I always wanted to be a co-host. Where is the chart? Okay, I don't see it here. I always love this when this happens when I'm on screen. There's a chart. Josh, I did it. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can now find the chart when I do share screen. Here it is. Can you see the chart? Yes. Well, no, we see a. I'm going to move it so that you can all see it, maybe. Um, maybe we'll move this over here. Can you all see the chart in front of you on screen? Yeah, Graduate School of Advanced Jewish yeah, yeah. Studies. Excellent, excellent. So when, when the Schechter Institute was founded in 1984, right? this is now uh, 38 years. When the Schechter Institute was founded in 1984, we thought there was one solution to the problem. 
which was the founder of a rabbinical school like JTS. We would train conservative Masorti rabbis. They would go out and found synagogues. And as they say in Hebrew, Shalom Yisrael, or in English, everything would be hunky-dory. Everything would be great. We would train rabbis who know how to speak to secular Israelis. They would go out and found synagogues and everything would be great. We quickly discovered in the 1980s that that is a good thing to do. It's an important thing to do, but it's not a sufficient thing to do. The people in my stories, the Hebrew language editor at Yidiot and the law students at Tel Aviv University and Gidi Dar are never going to set foot in the synagogue. So you can train the most wonderful rabbis in the world, but if Israeli, secular Israelis are not going to enter the synagogue, they're not gonna come and hear the drashot, the sermons of those rabbis. They're not gonna come hear the Torah reading on Shabbat morning. And they're not gonna be able to listen to the message which those rabbis want to get across. And what we did in the 19, late 1980s is we switched the purpose of the institution. The purpose of the institution was no longer just to train conservative rabbis. The purpose of the institution was to teach pluralistic Judaism to as many Israelis as is humanly possible. And what you have on the chart in front of you is we now teach over 100,000 Israelis every year in our programs. And I'd like to decide, describe what those programs are. And this is not an order of importance. All four of the programs are important and they do four different things. So at the top of the page, you have our MA program, our Graduate School of Jewish Studies. And as the rabbi hinted in, at in his introduction, it says that we have 360 MA students and 500 students in our adult education program. The adult ed program is meant for people who wanna study Torah Lishma, Torah for its own sake, like what you're doing right now. We have 250 people every semester taking those courses. But what I'm interested in is the 360 students in our MA program. Who are these students? These are teachers and principals and communal workers in the state of Israel. And if you are a principal or a teacher, a communal worker in Israel, and you back, go back to school and get a master's degree, your salary goes up. So every year you have an incentive for people to go back to school. But until Schechter came along, and still, until we founded the MA program in 1990, the usual subject that the principals and teachers studied was education. They got an MA in education. They got an MA in psychology or counseling. And that was it. And we discovered that there are huge numbers of Israeli teachers and principals and communal workers who really want to do an MA in Jewish studies. They want to find out what they missed, just as Gidi Dar wanted to find out what he missed and made the movie. And in the first year, we had five students in our MA program. In the second student, we had 25 students. In the third year, we had 50 students. And now we have about 360 students every year. And we have 1,900 graduates of our master's program. Each of those teachers and principals is working with at least 30 Israeli children every week. In Israel, the classrooms are very large. And if you're a principal of a school, you can have 500 or 700 kids in your school. And if you direct the JCC, a community center in Israel, you can have 3,000 families attending events at your JCC. So by teaching the principals and the teachers and the communal center directors all of these years, we are having a huge impact on Israeli society. It means that every week, every year, tens and tens of thousands of people are being taught and influenced by the Schechter Institute graduates and students of our MA program. The second major program is our rabbinical seminary. If you were go, to go back to Schechter in 1984 or 1987, we had 15 students in our ordination program. Well, we still have 15 students in our ordination program. The difference is that we now have a lot of other programs that previously we did not have. And I wanna highlight uh, two of them. The fourth line under the rabbinical seminary says, the Ashira Jewish Music Prayer Leaders Program, which is a very long way of saying, we teach adults how to chant the services. We teach adults Nusach. And we started, the, this is the fourth year. We now have 130 adults every year learning to chant the services in the Shechter Rabbinical Seminary. And there are three tracks. There's the Ashkenazic track, the Sephardic track, and the contemporary Jewish music track. 
And in the winter, they can study the Shabbat Nusach, and in the summer, they can study the High Holiday Nusach. And this has been a tremendously successful program in teaching lay people how to lead services. And these are people who come into Jerusalem from all over the country. Of course, in the time of COVID, we had to switch to uh, Zoom, but now it's in person again. A very successful program to teach lay people how to lead services. And the second very interesting example is the virtual baby midrash for special needs students. These are young adults with cognitive disabilities in their 20s, and rabbinical students meet with them once a month, and they study Jewish texts with young adults with cognitive disabilities. And they go through a special program in order to train them how to work with these young adults, and that too has been a very successful program as well. I now segue to the Tali program. The Tali program is the largest thing that Schechter does. As you can see, it says that we have 65,000 children in the program, but you'll see in a moment that it's actually much, much larger. What is Tali? Tali is not the name of my Israeli cousin, which it is, but Tali is an abbreviation. Tali stands for Tigvur Limudei Adut, Reinforcing Jewish Education. And the first Tali school was founded in Jerusalem in 1976, before Schechter existed, by a group of olim, of immigrants from the United States who are all conservative Jews. And they had a very simple problem when they made Aliyah in 1976. The problem was they had no place to send their kids to school. They didn't want to send their kids to an Orthodox public school because they were not Orthodox. And they didn't want to send their kids to a secular public school because there were no Jewish studies other than Tanakh. And they founded a new type of school in Israel, which is called the Tawi School, which is a secular public school plus Jewish studies. And the only American equivalent I can give you is a charter school. Just as a charter school in the United States adds on additional content to the regular public school curriculum, a Tali school adds on Jewish content to the regular Israeli public school curriculum. But the difference is that a charter school usually takes place, the extra stuff takes place after school. In the Tawi school, it's totally integrated into the school week, which means, I'm gonna hold up a couple of textbooks, which means that every Friday, every child in the Tawi schools is learning Parshat Shavua, unlike the students at Tel Aviv University. This is the third grade Tali Parshat Shavua book. There is a Parshat Shavua book for every grade of Tali teaching the kids Parshat Shavua. There is a Chagim textbook, a holiday textbook for every grade of Tawi, teaching the kids the Jewish holidays, which is also mostly ignored in the Israeli public school system. There is, there are the textbooks we produce now for the non-Tawi schools, which is listed under Tawi, it's listed as the fi uh, fifth item, non-Tawi schools using Tawi textbooks. We now produce a series of Tawi textbooks for non-Tawi schools, which means that one hour a week, over a hundred Israeli public schools are using our materials to learn about Judaism. Back to the Tali schools. We have the Tali preschool prayer book for younger children, kindergarten, first and second graders. They learn the Sidur and they use the Sidur throughout the country in the Tali school system. And the Tali senior prayer book, which is for grades three and up. If we were meeting in person, I would pass them around and show you what's inside these books. For grades three and up, where the older kids use these prayer books to pray on a regular basis. Now remember, these are kids who do not go to Shul at Shabbat, who do not pray with their parents. They are learning about Judaism through the Tali program in the Israeli secular public school system. And as you can see on the chart in front of you, there are 200 preschools, 76 elementary schools, 138 high school classes, almost 5,000 children, as well as we said, over 100 schools who are not Tali schools who are using our uh, textbooks. In addition, Tali produces curricular materials throughout the world. Uh, the last two lines of Tali are South American schools. The South American day schools now use a series of textbooks in Spanish and Portuguese produced by the Tali staff. And in Europe, we are now producing Jewish studies materials in 15 different languages, which are being used by Jewish day schools throughout Europe. 
But the bottom line is that Tali schools are restoring Jewish literacy to the children in the Israeli public school system. In Israel, I'll just give you one more statistic. You may say, well, what does 65,000 children mean? Or what does 76 elementary schools mean? It means that roughly 10% of the Israeli public elementary schools now feature the Tali program, 10%, okay? In 1987, when we adopted the program, there were 3,000 children. In the year 2000, there were 20,000 children. There are now 65,000 children in the Tali program. I wanna skip now to the bottom of the page, which is our outreach work. We run a very successful outreach center in Tel Aviv. It's called Neve Shechter. It's a beautiful building built 140 years ago, which we have restored. And for the past 10 years, it has served as an outreach center in Tel Aviv and attracts secular Israelis to Judaism through Jewish music and Jewish art. Uh, we listed the Neve Shechter Beit Midrash Learning Community. These are 225 adults who come and study adult ed at Neve Shechter on a regular basis. Every day of the week, you can take adult ed classes at Neve Shechter, all of them taught in Hebrew. The target audience is totally secular Tel Avivans who for the most part never previously studied any Jewish text at all. And now they can study Talmud and Midrash on Wednesday evenings, and they can study Jewish thought and Kabbalah on Thursday evenings, and they can study Tanakh on Friday mornings, Every day of the week, there are classes in Jewish studies directly aimed at the secular, young secular Tel Aviv population. So the Neve Shechter Outreach Center has been spectacularly successful in attracting secular Tel Avivans to our programs. The second thing is Midrash Shechter across Israel. These are adult ed courses, primarily in the Galilee, in cities which have smaller populations, where once or twice a week, they can come to adult ed courses and study Jewish texts. And this has been running now on a steady basis for the past 30 years. And finally, our network of schools and synagogues in Ukraine, which unfortunately during the past few months has turned into something entirely different. But uh, until February 23rd, this was a network of four synagogues and four schools in Kiev, Kharkov, Odessa and Chernovitz. You've heard at least three of those cities on the news on a regular basis during the past few months. Uh, we have a synagogue in each city, we have a school in each city, and we have Camp Rama Ukraine, which this summer is going to celebrate its 30th anniversary. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, that's what we did until February 23rd. Since the war began, we have turned our school network into a refugee organization. Uh, we are helping the Jews in all these, in all four cities that I mentioned. Uh, our main center of refuge has become Chernovitz, which uh, if, you, if you view my screen as a map of Ukraine, so Kiev is up here, Kharkov is up here near the Russian border, Odessa is down here near the Black Sea, and Chernovitz is off in the lower left-hand corner in the Southwest near Romania. And Chernovitz is of no interest whatsoever to the Russians <laughs> because it's on the other side of Ukraine. And there only one missile has fallen in that area since the war began. And Chernovitz has become our main center of refuge. Uh, well over 2000 people have passed through our synagogue in Chernovitz since the war began. Many of them remain in Chernovitz. We rented 11 apartments and they are living in those apartments. Many of them have left the country and are now in Berlin or in Israel. Uh, and we've been, we ran a, we've been running an emergency campaign to raise money for this. And together with our partners in Masorti Olami, we have already spent over $200,000 on uh, helping the Jews of Ukraine weather this very difficult storm. And ironically, uh, this summer we are going to hold the 30th season of Camp Rama Ukraine, but we are going to hold it in Romania <laughs> uh, because it's much safer in Romania. Uh, there are no, there's no bombings going on there. And believe it or not, Camp Rama Ukraine this summer is going to be held at a summer camp, which is called Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I couldn't make this up. It's called Pension Dracula. <laughs> and Pension Dracula is 180 kilometers northwest of um, Bucharest. And that's where Camp Romai Ukraine is going to hold its 30th season this summer. Normally, it's held in the western side of Ukraine. But we felt it's extremely important uh, to hold the regular summer camp for our kids from all over Ukraine, including those who have fled to Berlin, including some of those who have fled to Israel. And we plan to have about 100 kids at Camp Roma Ukraine in Romania uh, this summer. And we're also running a campaign right now to raise the money in order to do uh, that camp as well. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, our wonderful Midrashid network in Ukraine during the past uh, 100 days has turned into something else entirely. Uh, we hope that the war will end soon uh, so that we can return to our regular activities in Ukraine, which is synagogues and schools and summer camps. Uh, to return to my original drasha, and then you can ask questions. In my original drasha, I said that there, Israel's problem is that we have not figured out how to reconcile the Lech Lecha of Genesis chapter 12 and the Lech Lecha of Genesis chapter 22. In other words, how can Judaism and Zionism coexist? And I believe that through our programs that now serve over 100,000 Israelis every year, we have found the middle road between those two extremes. We are bringing pluralistic Judaism to over 100,000 Israelis every year through our various programs. They are reconnecting to Judaism. They love Judaism. They don't love religious coercion. They do not love the chief rabbinate of the state of Israel, but they love Judaism. And we have given them the opportunity to reconnect to Jewish history, to Midrash, to Mishnah, to Talmud, to the prayer book, to all the things that are so sorely lacking from the secular public school system uh, in the state of Israel. And we hope that all of these programs will continue to grow in years to come so that there will not be 100,000 people in our programs, but rather hundreds of thousands of people in our programs, because I believe that this uh, unity between Judaism and Zionism is not an option, but is absolutely necessary for the continued uh, health and spiritual welfare of the state of Israel. Uh, I have spoken enough. And if you have questions or comments, please feel free. Yes, Eva. So first of all, thank you. This was a very interesting talk and you're doing wonderful work there. Uh, also, it. my family originally comes from Chernovitz, so oh, okay. it feels personal. Um, but I'm wondering, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand why people who are Zionists wouldn't want to know Jewish history and Jewish, you know, the, the liturgy and all of that, because I would think it strengthens their claim to the land. Uh, the fact, you know, that the Bible is, is at the core of it. And if they don't know the whole biblical and, and rabbinic history, that weakens Zionism, then it just becomes a political movement. So why, why is I it- I agree entirely. Okay, so in order to understand the genesis of this problem, which I skipped over in my talk, uh, you have to go back to the founders of the State of Israel. Uh, the founders of the State of Israel were Ben Gurion and Golda Meir and Yitzchak Ben Svi, uh, labor Zionists. And, and labor, Zionists had, labor Zionism had an ideology which was number one, socialism, and of course the kibbutz movement. Number two, the revival of the Hebrew language. Number three, the Israeli army. Uh, number four, we are going to teach our children Tanakh and nothing more. Because we are rejecting diaspora Judaism that we grew up with in Eastern Europe. Uh, by the way, I've, I've been to uh, Ukraine four times uh, in Kiev, you can visit Golda Meir's house, the house that she was born in, in Kiev, okay? Before she moved to Milwaukee, before she moved to Israel, okay? These labor Zionists were consciously rejecting the diaspora Judaism of their parents. We don't need to make Kiddush on Friday nights. We don't need to light uh, Shabbat candles. We don't need to study Parshat Shavuot. 
We don't need to study Mishnah and Talmud. Most of those things were created in a diaspora and we have no interest whatsoever in transmitting that to our children. So they created a school system, which as I mentioned before, skips from the Tanakh to the Palmach. This was not an accident. This was their ideology. They wanted to create a new type of Jew. If you look at the old posters from the 1940s and 50s, the young Sabra with his Koba Tembel is holding a gun in one hand and a plow in the other, or a Tanakh in one hand and a gun in the other. And as this was a new Jew, not a diaspora Jew, but a died in the wool Israeli, right? And his role model was Judah Maccabee and King David. And we have no use for diaspora Judaism whatsoever. So once they set up the school system in that fashion, they created three generations of Israelis who didn't learn anything about Judaism. And they still don't. <laughs> and it was without the Tali program and without the Tali textbooks that we provide for the secular public schools in Israel, your average Israeli child goes to school for 12 years, never studied Parshat Shavua, never held a prayer book in their hands, obviously never visited a synagogue, and even a bar bat mitzvah. I went to all of my cousins' bar and bat mitzvahs in Tel Aviv. Do you know what it consisted of? It consisted of a disco party. That was it. <laughs> there wasn't even a Dvar Torah. If you ask an Israeli kid, did you have a bar mitzvah? Bevadai, come move on. And then you ask them, well, what did you do at your bar mitzvah? They said they had a party. So what the, what the founders of the state of Israel, and I have great respect for Ben Gurion in that generation, they revived the Hebrew language, they built the state of Israel, they built the Israeli army, they did all sorts of incredible things. But one of the bad things that they did is they killed Judaism. <laughs> and they did it on purpose. They didn't do it by accident. And what we've been doing for the past 38 years is a tikkun. It's a corrective measure. <laughs> we are simply restoring what should have been there to begin with. As one of our faculty members said at a faculty meeting a number of years ago, she's a well-known Israeli poet. I asked her to speak at the faculty meeting. And I don't remember what she said about poetry, but I remember her introduction. <laughs> her introduction was, at the age of 16, I discovered Perkeavo. I discovered the ethics of the fathers. And I was furious. Why did they hide this from us? Who gave them the right not to teach this to us? And since then, she's been studying Jewish texts. But we are simply returning to the Israeli public all of these Jewish texts of which they were deprived for decades. So, and in this generation, I'll just say one more thing. The reason for the huge growth of our programs is not because of our advertising budget, because our advertising budget is a joke. <laughs> the reason for the huge growth of our programs is because this is what Israelis are looking for now. The Israelis who come to our MA program, most of them hear about it from other Israelis. And the Tali principals who join the Tawi system, it's because another principal told them about the Tali program. And in the Vey Shechter in Tel Aviv, they come to our outreach courses and the art gallery and the music program because other Tel Avivans told them about the program. So this is something that Israelis are looking for. They want to reconnect. Yes, there was another question. Yes, Barbara. Now this not this is this is I was I'm extremely happy and impressed with everything I heard. And I don't think you can answer this, but my question is. The United States, it's not much different. Most of the people that I've known have been brought up secular. And I explained to the rabbi that my parents were first generation and it's the result of, so they want to be American. So how would you help fix it here? That's what my question <laughs> is. No problem. I can answer that question in 60 seconds. In by Zer Pashut, very simple. Well, I, I usually answer that. I, I'm asked that question many, many times. I usually answer that question by saying, I have a, enough tsaris here. You want me to solve your tsaris as well? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it is a major challenge to deal with the alienation from Judaism in the United States as well. Actually, I have okay. an answer. I actually have an okay. answer. You have to get very, very old like me. 
um, see everything, find out everything else about every other religion, and then you come okay, home. Okay, good. That, that is one solution. But clearly, clearly these problems exist in the diaspora as well. And it's not that we've totally ignored the problem. As I said, at the end of the Chawi chart, we provide tremendous Jewish studies curricular materials for South America and for Europe. But in both of those cases, we did not go out and recruit those people. They came to us. In South America, we were asked by the Seminario Rabinico, which is the conservative rabbinical seminary in, in Buenos Aires. The head of the Seminario called me up on the phone 10 years ago, Rabbi Ariel Stoffenmacher. He says to me, David, we always talk to each other in Hebrew. He says, David, we have a terrible problem. No one is writing curriculum materials for the day schools in South America. Let's take your tally materials and redo them for the school system here. I said, that's a great idea. And we went out and raised money together and we translated a lot of the tally materials into Spanish and Portuguese. And the same thing now happened in Europe. We were approached by a, a European organization called EFI to provide 80 curricular units for Europe, which the Tawi staff is writing in Hebrew. And they are being translated into 15 different European languages, including Finnish, Swedish, Hungarian, Danish, <laughs> Greek, <laughs> you name it, for use by Jewish day schools throughout Europe. So we are more than happy to help uh, Jews in the diaspora deal with these issues, but that is not the main purpose of our institution. The main purpose of Schechter is to restore Jewish literacy to Israeli Jews. And if in any way we can help diaspora Jews as well, we are more than happy to do so. Yes, Rabbi. I have oh, another. Eva, go ahead. And then I have Eva, go ahead. Eva, go ahead. Um, I have another question. Mm -hmm. You kind of dismissed the what you said is now 20 to 25 percent uh, Orthodox Jews in, in Israel. Um, and you said you named them as anti-Zionist. But is that really the case? All 20 to 25 percent? No, no, no. So uh, there was a Could sentence you clarify in the middle. A little yeah, bit there was a sentence in the middle you might have missed. I okay. said that roughly half of that 20 to 25 percent are modern Orthodox, and the other half are ultra-Orthodox. And the modern Orthodox serve in the army, and they work, and they go to college, and their school system also has problems, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. The, the major challenge of the state of Israel is the ultra-Orthodox, because the ultra-Orthodox do not serve in the army. The men, many of them are not in the workforce at all. The women are. And most ultra-Orthodox Jews, the women are supporting the household in terms of parnasa, in terms of working. Uh, and in their schools, they don't even teach tochnit liba. Tochnit liba is the uh, core curriculum of English, math, um, and so on. Uh, that is a huge problem for the state of Israel. I didn't dismiss the problem. It's just not that, my that's problem. About, that's 10% <laughs> of 10, 15% of the Israeli population? Yeah, it's, it's roughly between 10 and 12% of the Israeli population. Um, and that is a huge problem, but it's not the problem that I deal with on a regular basis. I deal with the 80, 75, 80% of Israelis who are not receiving a Jewish education. I'm not saying that the other problems are not problems. It's just, that's not what I deal with. Uh, it's a, the, it's a unfortunate that they're not making themselves be a resource for teaching other Israelis uh, Judaism, because they sure know it. I agree. And that's always, that's been the saddest part about the religious uh, communities in Israel. The modern Orthodox less so, but certainly the ultra Orthodox, their main concern is to provide money from the government for their own institutions. They don't care if the rest of the Israelis learn anything about Judaism. It's of no interest to them whatsoever. They want money for their own institutions. And they have, in Hebrew, you say, hem hifkiru et ashar. They have abandoned the rest. Because they don't think mm -hmm. it's their responsibility to teach Judaism to non-Orthodox uh, Jews. Of course, Chabad is different, but that's not the, the ultra-Orthodox establishment uh, in the state of Israel. Why, yes, Rabbi. Why, why is it, I had a different question, but I'm gonna ask uh, on, on this topic. Uh, you know, ten percent is a is a minority. 
and is a relatively small minority. You're talking about in the, the Tawi schools? No, no, no. I'm talking about the, the, the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and why do you get the sense that, that the, the ultra-Orthodox, you know, have such a hold on, on because they life do. in Israel? <laughs> I know, but why do they? If oh, it's, well, it's very if, simple. It, it's the parliamentary system in Israel. None of the major parties can ever form a government by themselves. They always need the minority parties. Since the state of Israel was founded, I think there was only one, we're now in the 16th Knesset. There was only one Knesset where an Orthodox party was not part of the governing coalition. From 1948 to 1977, the Labour Party was running the country. And they always relied on the Mafdal party, the religious Zionist party, as their backup. That was part of their coalition. When, when Begin took over in 77, he switched over to the Haredim. And the Haredim became the backup of his coalition. And the Haredim have been in almost every government since 1977. And their condition for being in a government is very, very simple. It's called dolarim. <laughs> money. <laughs> you give us money, we'll vote with you on a bunch of other issues. And for better or for worse, that's the way the parliamentary system works. So neither the Labour Party, nor the Likud Party, nor Yeshatid, none of the parties have ever had a majority in which they could run the government by themselves. They always need the minority parties, which is why the minority parties have a big say in what goes on in the state of Israel. Is that good or bad? I'll leave it to the political scientists to figure that one out. <laughs> but that is the way the parliamentary system works, and it works the same in many countries in Italy. It's just in the States, you have a two-party system, so you're not familiar with that uh, uh, method, but it's a very common method in European parliaments. Uh, in Germany right now, uh, the, 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 uh, the group running the government is a number of different parties working together. In France right now, Macron has a serious problem because it seems that the in this election now, most of the parliamentarians will not be in his party. <laughs> so he's going to be a president running with a running the country with a parliament that's not in his party. So the, these are the vagaries of parliamentary politics, which unfortunately uh, Israel has been dealing with now for 74 years. Right. Rabbi, I want you to put on your rabbi hat. Okay. okay, my rabbi and, hat. And, and, okay, there you go. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us all of the things that Schechter is doing from the educational point of view. And also you mentioned uh, teaching people how to lead services and so on. I, but my, my question is uh, that it's one thing to educate and it's one thing to uh, to create something that ha wasn't there, that was really needed, and that, that all these Tali kids learning things that they never learned before. And now we've got people that know Parshat Shavu and they know Pirkevot, and they know about Yantif and all that, you know. But the question is, how much is that a, uh, a part or is becoming a part of their Jewish identity? Uh, how much is the uh, education leading to, you know, I'm going to observe Shabbat, or I'm going to observe Kashrut, or I'm going to have, I have children, and I'm going to have them have a bar mitzvah that's going to be more than a, a disco party. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and how much mm -hmm. is the education effective? Um, because I, you know, uh, Barbara, you mentioned about, you know, the problems of, of American Judaism, whatever. I mean, I think, you know, we have that same issue, you know, we, we teach our children, but they come from homes that don't support what we're teaching them. And then they go off and do their own thing. And if, and if it's not being supported by the family and, and whatever, I'm just wondering if there's right. been any, um, uh, you know, um, research, you know, on, right. on the effectiveness of, right. of the thousands of kids that are going through Tali schools and all right. these people in, 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 in learning how to, to teach Yahadut, what is it doing? 
you know? Okay, right. So uh, I'll separate the answer into two segments. Uh, in terms of our MA graduates, we did a survey last year of our MA alumni. It was paid for by the Davidson Foundation, which is our biggest funder out of Detroit. It was done by an outside evaluator. It was a totally objective evaluation. I, I should have put it up on the screen. I don't have it here on the screen right now to show you. Uh, the results were really, we surveyed our 1900, at that time it was 1800 graduates. And the results were really spectacular. 93%, uh, right? These are people in their 40s and 50s who are graduates of the Schefter Institute MA program. Most of them secular. 93% said that they learned about Jewish pluralism by studying at Schechter. They didn't know anything about the streams in modern Judaism. 95% said that they learned how to study Jewish text at Schechter. They had never studied Jewish text before. 65%, and this goes directly to your question, 65% said that their studies at Schechter had an impact on their personal and professional lives, meaning what do they observe and what they teach uh, out of the field. Uh, in other words, we know from this survey, and the, the actual survey was 50 pages long. I have a one-page summary, but the survey asked very detailed uh, questions. We know from this survey now, what I've known for years from talking to our graduates, which is that it has a huge impact on their personal lives and on their professional lives, both the way they live as Jews and also what they do out in the field. And I'll just give you two examples about the living as Jews. Uh, one of our first MA graduates in the 90s was Mira Garzi. Mira Garzi lives on Kibbutz Beit Hashita, which is a totally secular kibbutz. And after studying at Schechter, she started having a Kabbalat Shabbat every week in her house. I don't think there's a synagogue, an active synagogue in her kibbutz, and doing Kiddush every Friday night. Okay, this was the result of her studying at Schechter. Was that the purpose of us teaching her a chapter? No, that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to teach her about Judaism. If we said to her, we want you to become from, <laughs> she never would have come to Shechter to begin with, right? A second story. I teach a course every few years at Shechter that's called the Status of Women in Jewish Law. I've published many responsa on the subject. Um, and um, one of the subjects I teach in this course is, uh, is it permissible for women to recite the mourner's cottage? Which for a Jew in the United States sounds like a silly question. Well, obviously it's permissible for women to recite the mourner's cottage. Well, at most of the Orthodox synagogues in Israel, women do not recite the mourner's cottage, okay? And if they do, they do it quietly and they can't do it by themselves, okay? This is simply a sociological fact. So I taught the course, in the course, I taught the subject for three weeks, usually about three weeks at every subject. And there was a, a woman in the course who was a teacher. She lives on Kibbutz Malkia, which is on the Lebanese border near Kiryat Shmona, in the, what's called the finger, the finger of Israel, way up north. And the fourth week, the week after we finished studying the topic, Mira raises her hand and she says, Professor Golinkin Yeshli Hoda'a. She says, I have an announcement to make. I said, okay, Bakasha. <laughs> she says, this past week was my mother's yard site. Right, she lives on a totally secular kibbutz. She said, this past week was my mother's yard site. As a result of what we studied in your course, this past week, for the first time in my life, I recited the Mourner's Kaddish. I went to my mother's grave in Kriyachmona. And I recited the Mourner's Kaddish as a direct result of what we studied in your course. As the saying goes, she made my day. <laughs> she made my week. She made my year. So this happens all the time, that the students who study in our academic programs draw closer to Judaism and Jewish practice as a result of study. Do we advertise that that's what we're teaching? Of course not, because if we did that, we wouldn't have any students, right? But through, as a result of studying Jewish texts and studying about Judaism, they end up with a much more positive attitude towards Jewish practice uh, as well. In terms of the Tali schools, we do not have a survey. I mean, we have a survey of a lot of things about Tali. We do not have a survey about practice, and that is because we cannot do such a survey. Uh, given the political climate in Israel, if you go into an elementary school and you try and do a survey of Jewish practice, 
you'll be thrown out on your tushy, as they say. <laughs> you cannot do such a survey. The school system doesn't allow it. The parents don't allow it. They consider that religious coercion. So we cannot directly ask the children and their parents what it is that they observe. But I can tell you, first of all, that many Tali parents today were Tali children 30 years ago, because we're now in the second generation of Tali parents, right? These are kids who grew up in the Tali schools who make a point of sending their kids uh, to Tali schools. Um, and secondly, we see, I mean, I go in, I've been in Tali schools all over the country, and I see the way that the kids uh, learn about the holidays. I see the way that they pray, the way that they daven. And most of them, the only place that they daven is in a Tawi school, right? Their parents did not go to synagogue, but they have learned how to daven thanks to the Tawi school system. And I'm going to conclude by telling you one more story since uh, my voice is going to give out if I keep talking for another hour. Um, this was reported in a, uh, in a book by Tom Segev. Have any of you heard of Tom Segev? Tom Segev, a, a number of his books have been translated into English. He's a very interesting reporter. Um, and he wrote a book about the Holocaust and the state of Israel, the way Israelis relate to the Holocaust. And in that book, there's a chapter about, um, not exactly about March of the Living, but about the trips that Israeli high school students take to Poland. Okay, and this was COVID. He killed this for two years, but it's now being restored. Uh, thousands of Israeli high school students go to Poland every year to learn about the Holocaust. And he described, he went along on, I don't know if on one trip or more than one trip, he described a visit to Poland with these high school students that he went with them. And he said that he said they would arrive at a memorial for the Holocaust. The Orthodox kids all knew what to do, right? They pulled their cedar rim out of their pockets. They recited a chapter of Psalms. They recited El Malay Rachamim. They knew what to do. He says the secular kids didn't have a clue what to do. They milled around. They talked to each other, but they didn't know what Jews do in order to commemorate the dead. He says the kids at the Tali High School, they were on this trip, the kids at the Tali High School, they were not wearing kippot. They get to the more Holocaust Memorial. They pull a kippah out of their pockets. They pull a siddur out of their pockets and they knew exactly what to do. So you look at these kids and you say, well, they're secular Israeli kids. Yes, they're secular Israeli kids who know what Jews do. And they know what Jews do because they studied in the Tali School. So this is, this is the result uh, of getting a Tali education that they may not be from and they may not daven three times a day, but they know what Jews do. And that is something that most Israelis do not know. So that is that is the type of observance that the kids have picked up by studying in Tali schools. Do I have a survey? No. <laughs> but I have decades of stories of the success of Tali education in teaching Israeli children about that they are Jewish, that being Jewish is a part of their lives. It's nothing to be afraid of and it's nothing to run away from. Uh, I think I've spoken enough. I thank you. Rabbi Lincoln, yes. let me Janet. just add something and make your day right. because, or your night, because two weeks ago we had our bar and bat mitzvah program uh, children uh, at Nevi Khana. There you go. Okay, and thanks to our rabbi, Lerone Levy, who was ordained at Shekta, and our program of having the rabbi on the staff at Nevi Khana. Our children are learning every day about being Jewish, mm -hmm. and they celebrate every holiday. And thanks to Le Lerone and before that, Yoav, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. learn exactly what the holiday is. And every Shabbat, they have services and they know all about Kashrut because the entire village is under Kashrut. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you can be proud of, and of course, 
Lerone has brought the Tali education books and program mm -hmm. to the children of Nevihana. So, so thank you very I much for reminding me, Janet. I, since, you're, since I can't see you on screen, I forgot to mention this. I only see your ceiling. <laughs> here I am. Here I am. <laughs> so we've but, made a partnership yes. with Neveh Khanna many years ago. The Neveh Khanna is part of the Tali Network. Uh, we provide the textbooks. Rabbi Liron, our graduate, is uh, fantastic. She goes there on a regular basis, works with the kids and the counselors and everybody else on the staff. Uh, our Tali supervisor visits of the central region visits uh, Neve Khanna on a regular basis. So Neve Khanna is again, one of the uh, wonderful examples of the way that uh, Tali materials and education are affecting Israeli children. Uh, and in this mm -hmm. case, it's both the Tali materials and our wonderful graduate uh, Rabbi Liron Levy. Minding. Jim put on Svillin, our boys, mm -hmm. and our girls with Talits when they have our bat mitzvah. And um, it was beautiful to hear them chant their Parsha two weeks ago when they were called to the Torah for their Aliyah. Very nice. So, well, thank you for sharing yeah. that, Janet. And that really fits in very nicely with everything that we've been saying. Today. I, I, I want to say, I want to say thank you to Rabbi Galinkin for giving us an hour and a bit uh, of, of some real positive energy. So often we meet together and we wring our hands at the, uh, the Palestinian issue and, and, all, and, and the anti-Semitism and the way that Israel is, is uh, talked about on the campus. And we deal with all of these problems. And although you're dealing with problems, but you're doing it in such a, a positive way. And I think of our this is not a fundraising meeting this is not a fundraising meeting but obviously we would love for you to support our work uh, all you have to do is visit schechter.edu and you can contribute rather to general, to specific programs, to our Ukraine emergency fund. Um, everything that I described to you, these programs are over 100,000 people. Uh, in a good year, uh, this costs us $9.3 million. Uh, the past two years have not been good years, <laughs> more like $8.3 million. Uh, we have to raise uh, $6 million every year uh, to do the things that we do. Uh, and of course, during this emergency in Ukraine, we're raising huge amounts of money, which we never had to raise before for doing things we never had to do before. Uh, but we're you dealing see, you with have, this you situation. You have to raise six million. The, the three right. comes from tuition or government? Where, where's the, the, rest of the, the, three, the three comes from uh, tuition, from sale of Tali textbooks, from endowments, from all sorts of other uh, sources. You get any any uh, help from the from the government? Yes, uh, before before Corona, we were up to about one point eight million shekels a year from the Israeli government. Divide that by uh, three point three to arrive at the dollar amount. Uh, during Corona, the, it was terrible. Most of the government funding was uh, lost, not just to us, to everybody. Uh, in 2021, we went back up to 1.8 million shekels a year from the Israeli government, which again, the question is whether it's half full or half empty. Compared to the Shas party, <laughs> it's not even a drop in the bucket. The ultra-Orthodox get billions of shekels from the Israeli government. But we are happy that we get 1.8 million shekels a year from the Israeli government, uh, and we could always do better. And we also raise quite a bit of money in Israel uh, from Israelis. Uh, I don't know the number offhand for a specific year, but we've raised up to $600,000 a year from Israelis, from private sources uh, for our projects. So we are raising money from Israelis, we are raising money from the Israeli government, but still the bulk of the money we need to raise comes from uh, North America. So if you can help, we will certainly appreciate it. 
Uh, and needless to say, if you get to Israel, we would love to see you visit us either at Shechter in Jerusalem or at Neve Shechter in Tel Aviv. So thank one, you very one, much. We, we, every week we send out a little, uh, there's a link. Uh, when, when the war started in Ukraine, uh, it was the Schechter Institute that was very, very uh, integrally involved in helping the Jewish community in the Ukraine well, and, uh, and, and uh, making that uh, a possibility to our, to our synagogue. And uh, I want to dan uh, to Israel that although there's a lot of secularism in Israel, there is something about, uh, I know for me, uh, the fact that Israel is on the, on the Jewish calendar and uh, the sixth day isn't Saturday, it's Shabbat. And, uh, and, and, and uh, there, there, there is a, uh, when, when you get to Israel, there is, there, there is an unbelievable uh, connection you know, that brings that le- the two lechachas together. And, uh, and I think that what, what the, the Shachter Institute is doing is, uh, is so exciting because uh, within that context, I think there is a great opportunity for this synerg- synergy between what Israel, with what secular Israel is all about, that is very Jewish with Hebrew as a, as a language, and uh, you know, and, and the holidays as national Jewish holidays as national holidays, and all those things that are happening, you put that together with with a little bit of education, you have a real opportunity for right. The framework is the framework is there. The basis is there. We just need to deepen and expand all the opportunities. Keep doing for the great work. Thank you so much, everybody. Tadaraba. Thank you all very much. Tadaraba. Good. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom.